May I have a question? Sure. Uh, so uh, I, I understand that graphene is a kind of a relatively new material. Is that right, Sarah? Uh, graphene was uh, originally discovered in 2004 and they got the Nobel Prize for that in 2010, I think. So, I mean, 2004, I would say it is relatively new compared to other materials, yeah, yeah. but not that new, right? Yeah. Right, yeah. So, uh, so, so maybe can you uh, tell, tell me uh, broadly about the applications of uh, graphene in, in, in our life? Can, where can I find it? <laughs> Right. I mean, people talk about all kinds of stuff uh, with graphene. I think, the, I mean, you know, they talk about using graphene for, you know, transistors as a transistor, for example, right? And uh, also now like that, they have discovered the superconductivity in graphene. You can use it as a superconductive channel for electrical circuits. So you have zero loss circuits, basically, right? You don't have to worry about heating the circuit at all if you have superconducting, you know, wires in the circuit. Uh, and also like people talked about uh, graphene display. So since it is so thin, you can make atomically thin displays. So that's another application of graphene. And people have used graphene for detecting DNA nanostructures as well. So they make tiny holes in graphene uh, and they measure the electrical conductivity of graphene while they pass DNA through it. And depending on what kind of, uh, you know, sequence you have, you get different, you know, uh, pulse, you know, different uh, electrical conductivity through graphene. So there are like, I think there is a lot of applications like people are working on graphene, but nothing, I think nothing has been like industrialized, you know, it's not like, you know, uh, in large scale. It's mostly in the lab, I would say at the moment. And also like battery technology as well, you know, so. Okay, thank you, Sagar. Yeah. I have a question, Sagar. Yeah. It's a straight one. Okay. Yeah, uh, it's very interesting approach. So I guess my question is, uh, what's the resolution can you get out of, because this angle is very, very sensitive, right? So uh, that's number one. And number two, typically with the scotch tape kind of approach, you don't always get single layer, right? So, I mean, typically right. you end up getting bilayer or even thicker. So right. does, does this approach actually, you know, adaptable to that kind of a multi-layer sort of angle instead? Oh, uh, yeah. So the first part of the question is like, what kind of resolution can we get, right? So the Moray super lattice, uh, you know, the typical uh, lattice constant is about like 30 nanometers. So, you know, tens of nanometers. And the resolution with the PFM, I think it is like five nanometers. So I think that should be good enough to at least see like, you know, the uh, lattice, uh, you know, uh, structure uh, of this Moray lattice. Uh, so resolution would not be a problem. And also the tip, uh, you know, it's like a few nanometers wide tip, you know, so that also determines what the resolution is. So for uh, graphene super lattice, you know, it is like, you know, uh, perfectly like, you know, reasonable to, you know, expect, you know, seeing more a super lattice using this technique. Uh, and uh, and the second part of the question was like uh, the multi-layer graphene, right? And uh, the way we... I guess like the way we make these graphene samples right now, make these stacks is we individually pick up, we first identify the single layer graphene under optical microscope. And also you can verify that it's single layer by using a technique called Raman spectroscopy. Uh, so you sign right. laser onto the material and look at the reflection. So we individually pick the layer and you know stack them on top of other. Uh, so, I mean, you know, if even if there are like, you know, multi-layer, samples on the substrate, you know, we don't really worry about them because we are, you know, identifying a monolayer and picking that up from that substrate and putting it a, in a clean substrate where you have just a single monolayer, right? So, you know, even if you have multi-layer on the original substrate, it doesn't really matter, right? Uh, uh, but I guess like, you know, in terms of if you really want to look at the twist angles on those multi-layer, uh, you know, flakes that you find, I think like it's a reasonable way to like, test, you know, if it, I think like it should work, you know, even in those multi-layer uh, flakes, if you want to look at the twist angles. I guess the other, the other thing to sort of follow up is, as far as scaling, how how do you envision scaling in this? Because it seems right. like to me, that's all one of the biggest issues, right? Because right. Uh, I mean, if you look at the from a semiconductor industry, for example, obviously this is far from there. So how, can you get like a large scale, I guess, with the magic angle? That, that's really... Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think uh, 
uh, you know, most of the scientific community who are working on fundamental research on looking at electronic structure of, you know, these new materials, I think they are not really concerned about the, uh, you know, manufacturability of this uh, process, scaling it up, because, you know, they are, you know, looking into this really like fundamental stuff, and they don't really care too much about that, right? But, you know, companies like Samsung, like industries, you know, like, like Samsung, uh, and other Intel, you know, they are looking into CVD graphene, and they are also making progress on uh, the mobility of electrons in these graphene devices, which are, you know, large scale, you know, like, you know, 10 feet by 10 feet, you know, something like that, right? Uh, I mean, of course, the issue is the quality of those CVD graphene, but I think they are making good, uh, like, progress in that end. Uh, from what I remember, I think when they started making CVD graphene, uh, it, the mobility was like, you know, uh, uh, you know, a few hundred, but now it's like, you know, tens of thousands, you know, even in CVD graphene. So it's but, getting but better. Is there an approach to do CVD with twisted ar architecture or this is still manual? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not an expert in CVD graphene, but I, I don't know. Uh, to be honest, I don't know the answer for that, you know, like uh, whether people have figured out how to make twisted graphene with CVD. Uh, because the only one, this only technique I'm familiar with, like that, most of the major research group have done is using like you know uh, mechanical like yeah. stacking you physically right. control the angle right uh, yeah i'm not sure about like cvd twisted uh, graphene yeah. thank you yeah thanks thank you so much thank we you. will now move on to our next presenter which will be chris bernson great thank you <laughs> shared here okay so hopefully everyone can see my screen and hopefully it's a presentation and not something else um so my name is chris Branson. i'm an associate professor at, at james madison university out here in virginia uh, just to give you a sense of of who we are at jmu uh, we're located in the shenandoah valley of virginia about two hours south and west of washington dc um, in our department, it's all undergraduates. We have no, no graduate program, no postdoc. We have about 200 majors across the, the four to five years it takes students to, to finish college, and they're spread across about four or five different academic programs within our department. Um, and they split into professional school, the workforce, and the graduate school pretty evenly. Um, and one of the things that is really great about our department is um, about 90% of those graduates that we do have um, have done at least one semester of mentored research, and many of them have done uh, two or three years by the time they graduate. We are pretty good at getting freshmen into our labs, um, this, you know, first or second week of, of classes, actually, and then they stick around for three or four years. And so that's really a joy to have. And so, um, and, you know, we have a, a great science, but also we have a great environment around here. This is the view out of our building, and, and that's the Blue Ridge Mountains over there. And just beyond that is West Virginia. So we can be in the Shenandoah National Park very quickly or the George Washington Forest and having a good time uh, between science experiments. Um, so here's my summer research team, um, Sean, Angie, Abigail, Elise, and Angelina. And then Ruby is a recently graduated high school student, but she's worked with me in the lab for four years. She started as a freshman in high school. And then um, here's my daughter. She comes out and hangs in the lab too. She's eight. She loves doing experiments and she can actually do dilutions pretty well. So uh, some of the data I'm showing actually is from the experiment she's helping me set up right here in this picture. So um, I'll, I'll get through all of them. But the main players here are Angie, who is currently out at Berkeley Labs, and she's been finishing up collecting data. Ruby helps me with a lot of the code stuff, um, and she's going to be a computer science major in college. And then my daughter helps me when we're in lab doing stuff while nothing else going on. So the main projects that my lab works on is there's Project Eyeball, which is looking at uh, cone and rod cell development, but that's not one that we're gonna focus on because that's um, not directly related to what we're doing at Berkeley Labs this summer. Um, the second and third one here are the big ones that are going to be benefiting from the work that we've been doing with the program. Look at the structure and the biochemistry of starch beta amylases from Arabidopsis, and then applying what we do and what we can learn from these projects to course-based research experiences in lecture settings, but also a couple of lab settings as well. So starch is the big player in my lab. Starch is a carbohydrate. It's found in plants mostly, but humans have found ways to use it not only for nutrition, um, but also for making plastics and biofuels. The laundry industry uses it for uh, siphoning 
laundry. It's used in paper. Uh, the paper that you may be taking notes on right now uh, has starch in it that keeps the ink from spreading around. And so if you had starchless paper, the ink would spread throughout the paper. Um, adhesives. And it was used in both of the world wars for explosives. It was found in hand grenades, actually. So starch has been a hugely important molecule for humans to use. Um, but we still don't know much about the structural aspects and how it's regulated in plants. Um, starch is a huge molecule, one of the largest molecules uh, on the planet um, with a pretty powerful, with a, you know, not a hugely powerful micro microscope. You can see individual uh, molecules of it. And then as you work down to the layers um, of these granules that I have shown here on the right, um, you find out it is layered sort of like an onion where there are um, highly ordered layers where the, the, the carbohydrates form these chains and pack quite tightly. And then in between the layers, there are sort of layers where it's, it's not as ordered. It's, it's uh, sort of just connected, but not really held together by any strong um, interactions at all. And how these layers are formed and how the chains are all being ordered together and what causes the granule to form these regular layers and the size between plants is really one of the focuses uh, or, or the fo focuses about my lab because we just don't know that. Different plants have different styles of starch. They have different layers. They have different gaps between the layers. And so it's been a challenge to understand in a general sense about starch and, and how we can use it usefully uh, because we don't know how it's formed and how it is necessarily broken down at a real molecular level. At a biological level, starch is formed during the day by a series of en enzymes. Um, and then at night, it is broken down, um, but from the outside towards the inside uh, by enzymes called starch hydrolases. And beta amylases are a form of starch hydrolase. And starch is broken down from these long polymers into disaccharide called maltose. And then maltose can be used by the plant for uh, food at night. Um, but then it can be used by humans to ferment beer or to do other things as well. So breaking down starch into components is also a useful and uh, interesting task. So if you were to really sort of get what's the main question that we're interested in is what does the amylase, the enzyme we're interested in, see uh, when we're looking at the starch granule? What is it looking for in the starch that it hooks onto and then uses to then break down the starch overall? And sort of the approach that we're thinking is we're going to compare different uh, substructures of starch from a maltodextrin, which is a chain of glucose, to longer order chains like amylose and amylopectin. And then we've got some larger, not quite starch molecules, but they sort of look like a starchish molecule in solution that we're going to give to these amylases and see what they're able to do with that. And identify what they prefer uh, in, in a way to model how they break down starch. Now, one of the things that we don't know is even though I've, I've drawn these out here with pretty explicit structures, we don't actually know what these structures look like in solution. So these different carbohydrate chains, while we think we know what they look should look like based on principles of biomolecule folding, we don't actually have a good idea of what they look like in solution. The other challenge is a lot of the biochemical techniques that we use to look at uh, structure are optimized for proteins and nucleic acids. And if this one thing I've learned this summer is that carbohydrates are not proteins and they are not nucleic acids, a lot of what we know and have used in the past doesn't apply to these carbohydrates. And so that can present a challenge. And that's where uh, VFP and working at Berkeley Labs comes in is as I'm moving away from proteins and towards trying to understand these carbohydrates, uh, using the tools that are available at Berkeley Labs and the expertise of the, of the faculty and staff there at understanding these carbohydrate structures. So our goals were to determine and predict the structure of these uh, different glucans with what we call increasing complexity, um, using a variety of techniques that are available out there. And then software that's out there is optimized for protein. So we're going to probably have to write some new code and software uh, for these carbohydrates, but also begin to apply that to high throughput types of scanning that they do at ALS there. So uh, this is our main project and what we've been working on for the past eight weeks or so. And it's, it's been a lot of fun to head in that direction. Um, 
the main technique we've been using is small angle x-ray scattering. And so uh, in this, we have an x-ray source and then our sample in some sort of small capillary tube. And the x-ray scatter uh, after interacting with the biomolecule. And uh, we can use that scattering angle to infer information about size and shape, and some of the secondary features. And so where this is useful for looking at our glucans is we can tell if they're an extended conformation or if they're in a helical conformation or if they're very compact or if it's an ensemble of structures. Um, and so that was real, the real advantage of coming out to Berkeley was the access to uh, instrumentation to do small angle x-ray scattering. Um, so uh, the beam line can conduct it at the beam line at uh, ALS can conduct in two different formats. One is coupled to, protein, uh, sorry, to a purification system, and the other is a high throughput where we can collect 96 samples in about two hours. Um, and it's, this is the instrument and uh, the different pieces of it that we've got access to and we're able to, to interact with quite a lot. So this was a lot of fun to use this instrumentation because you'll never find this at a PUI at all. And so uh, we were able, able to use this. We were buying commercial uh, sources for our carbohydrates. And when we first did separation of them through the size exclusion column and then collecting the SACS data on it, um, we found that we had long chains of dextrin, what we actually wanted to see, and then the contaminating maltose and glucose. So we needed to do some cleanup before we could uh, actually collect our data. Uh, but that cleanup, of our samples as we did column purification and precipitations, we uh, got some different uh, information and we're now trying to tease out what we lost as we were changing our, our preparation to understand uh, how that changed um, the structures and, and our information that we'll get. Um, and we also found that we use different solvents. Our chains are adopting different conformations in solution. And so this is gonna be useful as we do the purifications, but also as we're trying to study uh, what we are looking at for our enzymes. We do our enzyme assays in potassium chloride, but certainly if we go to ammonium bicarbonate or uh, sodium, sodium thiocyanate, we're gonna see different structures and we might also see the enzyme get uh, different, uh, di have different preferences for that. So that was pretty fun to look at. And also we have connections to Hofmeister potentially. Um, we've been writing code to analyze a lot of this and to look at, at damage. And we've got a new script that can get a lot of uh, information about the, the data as it's coming off. And it works pretty well. Um, when they're doing this high throughput, they're generating 3,000 data frames at a time. And so you've got to be able to go through it quickly to help the users understand what they're seeing. Our code that we've been able to do generates a lot of these statistics in a pretty quick way. And we've been able to go through about 7,500 files in seven minutes and uh, really scan through a huge amount of data that they generate uh, this in about a day. Uh, this will help them and the users of the facility uh, understand what they're getting in terms of their data. So where is this going to help me? And as we're taking this home, well, I've got my eight to 10 research lab students that I have and our main questions, but I also use this in my biochemistry lab, which has 35 students and my lecture, they help me with looking at data and a lot of the techniques we've generated and uh, data we've generated so far will show up in these classes, but also we apply a lot of this information to general chemistry. And so in the spring, I had 378 students working for me across these different classes and in these different settings. And so uh, going to Berkeley and grabbing, having new techniques and access to new information and, and things like that, uh, will benefit not only the students in my lab and my career, but also hundreds of others at JMU who are working on these different projects in my department. So um, you have about one more minute to wrap up. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yep. So um, we've so far got a workflow to purify commercially available maltodextrins and analyze their structure by SACS. Um, we'll help. These will help us as we try to aid in describing what our enzymes are going to see in solution. And then certainly for the projects that I have with into plastics or what ALS is in, interested in, which is biofuels, um, knowing these conformations and how starch is formed and broken down uh, will help us as we're trying to use it for these different human and industrial uses. Um, different structures of starch lead to different optimized, optimized uses for humans overall. So um, yeah. 
thank the Angie and Ruby who are doing most of the work on the project, um, the staff at, at Sybil's Beamline who we're working with at ALS, and then these different funding agencies for supporting me and the VFP for letting me come out and have a good time, not only at Berkeley, but also working remotely. So uh, thanks everyone. And now we have a few minutes for questions. If anyone has questions for Chris. I got one or I got a, com a comment and a question. Um, so uh, great talk uh, as um, a person who's been in the VFP program for like six years, um, I can count um, I think on half of one hand, how many biochemists uh, have been participating in the program? And I feel like I'm the only biologist in the room, so it's really great to hear. I mean, I, I love the I love the modeling, I love the orbitals and things, but um, you know, hearing all about uh, some some biology and some biochemistry always makes me excited. So great talk. Um, my question was uh, when you were covering the different. Um, confirmations you were seeing uh, from, what was it, the maltodextrin out of the bottle, and, and then um, after you uh, purify it on the column, I think, uh, you were seeing differences, um, and then you, you mentioned something about precipitating the, um, uh, the starch and then reconstituting it. Do you think that that precipitation um, uh, kind of uh, destroyed some of the sort of like, I guess, natural structures that were there in, in the bottle from however they purified it. Um, and then uh, maybe that's the reason for the difference. I was I was kind of curious on your thoughts on what, what might've caused that difference that you were seeing. Right, so with the maltodextrins, I don't anticipate that being a problem, but I think you bring up a good point and something we always need to be keeping in the back of our mind is, is the purification affecting what we're seeing long-term? So that is where we need to go back and figure out what we lost along the way. Uh, the purification, the chromatography, we're eliminating some of the longer and bigger stuff that's in our contamination, and we think the precipitation is losing the smaller stuff that's still soluble in the ethanol, whereas the chains are not going to be. So um, we're at a very sort of early stage in understanding this, but the nice thing is, is what we've developed there at ALS, we can match that with the equipment have at, we have at JMU. So we'll be able to continue this um, as soon as Angie gets back, which is hopefully Monday or Tuesday next week. And so uh, we'll be picking up with that exact question to understand, well, have we affected a structure that was existing or have we destroyed something along the way? And then applying to the larger molecules and looking at our more starch-like molecules, I think that's also where we're really going to run into that issue much more, more so than the smaller commercial maltodextrins. And just, just a quick follow-up. Um, do you, I mean, do you envision like, I don't know, grinding up some spinach leaves, uh, isolating chloroplasts and looking at more kind of like, uh, like start structures that you have more say on how they're purified, like more gently versus the stuff in the bottle, which I, I, I mean, they're purified I, I, by some means that you might not know of. Right. So the, um, the micrograph that I showed probably on slide five or so of those starch granules, that was stuff that we purified from Arabidopsis leaves and we collected here ourselves. So yes, that is exactly the direction we're heading. Um, once we have a better handle on simpler systems, then we'll take on the complexity of the full starch itself. Cool, thanks. Yeah, I, I would also like to ask something. Uh, Chris, you mentioned that around 90% of the students at JMU uh, do research in their undergrad. That's really impressive. Um, is there already like a course-based research experience there, or is that something you're looking to get into? And if so, how has maybe your experience at Berkeley Lab maybe influenced that? Yeah, so the biochem lab, the biochem lecture, and the gen chem labs I teach are all designed as course-based research, research experiences, just different levels. Uh, gen chem lab is the freshman experience, man, but the one I teach is for the non-majors. So this is engineers, health sciences, they're um, biology majors, they're all making plastics for me, but they get to design their own plastic, as in I hand them the starch, I say this is the general procedure, and then they can add in whatever, whatever they want, food dye, um, they've added in different things and just study the properties, but also thinking about how that could be uh, affect how it's broken down with the idea of being making recyclable plastics in the long term. Then those plastics um, are into my biochem lab. 
And then the students are using the enzymes to break down those plastics that were formed and studying that. And then my biochem lecture, the students are modeling the enzymes themselves and predicting how the plastics fit into the enzymes. And so this is all novel research, but it keeps me going because I have to teach three classes, four classes a semester. And so harnessing the power of all the undergraduates and having 300 students at, at three different course levels working on different aspects uh, keeps a lot of it moving. That's great to hear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Chris. Our um, final presenter of today will be Frank Yip. I can't hear you, Frank. We can't hear you. Still can't hear you. You want to go out and come back in really quickly? There's like no sound. Still can't hear you. Looks like Frank is going to do a restart. I guess now will be a great time to do some announcements while we're waiting for Frank to come in. So let me grab that. For all VFP faculty members, we have our faculty networking event this afternoon. So if possible, please be in attendance. We're actually going to have some fun. This is not a business meeting. We're actually going to do something that's actually fun. So I encourage you all to please attend so that we can have some time to hang out with each other outside of work and talking about science and all of those things. We just want to have some fun with you guys this afternoon. And if you have trouble locating the link, it is on the faculty calendar that is shared with you. I see you're back, Frank, but I still can't hear you. Hello? Now we can hear you. Oh, now you can hear me. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, let me try to screen share now. Can you all see that now as well? Yes. Yes? Okay, terrific. Great. Um, so, sorry about the technical difficulties, folks. Or thanks for being patient. Let me do this presentation. Hopefully, you all can see that. <clears throat> Um, so yeah, um, thanks for being patient. Sorry about that. Uh, so I'll present a little bit about um, our work in the uh, atomic, molecular, and optical physics group in chemical sciences. Um, so I'm one of the uh, uh, quantum uh, chemists here who works on kind of um, understanding electron correlation in small atoms and molecules. And so I'll talk a little bit about kind of uh, work that has been going on for a few um, bluff BFP cycles. Um, and kind of long-term projects from, from that sort of thing. So this is very incremental work and probably some of you will have seen uh, a, a little bit about what we've done. Um, I also like to tell you all about uh, where we come from. So um, Cynthia and I are, are based out of the uh, Cal State University Maritime Academy, which is um, a small school in the Bay Area in Vallejo, California. So not far from Berkeley Lab, about 20, 30 minutes up the uh, highway. and. Uh, Kind of our focus is with um, kind of maritime industry and, and uh, engineering. So, so we have a challenge in that we don't have any graduate students at all, but we certainly don't even have undergraduates in uh, physics or chemistry or kind of related fields. Um, which is not to say that we aren't able to do some things with students. 
Um, and in fact, through VFP, I've managed to have a, a student, but they're usually kind of doing this very, very extracurricularly um, out of interest and because it's a good opportunity and things like that. So kind of on this slide here, I'm showing you um, some photos of work that we had with my most recent students. Um, because of the, uh, the uh, work from home and pandemic issues, I haven't really investigated having a student come back, um, but hopefully next year we'll be able to be more in person. Um, theory groups, of course, we, we can work remotely, but, but um, my interest is in having a student actually come to the lab because of the unique experiences that that, that gives us. So hopefully, uh, <clears throat> you know, we're able to do this in a more normal fashion. And I appreciate those of you who are back and, and hopefully uh, are getting full advantage of that, of you know, proximity and location, it's important. So kind of to motivate this, let me tell you um, kind of what our interest is in. Um, we study double photoionization, which um, con consider an, uh, a molecule of modest size or anything like that. Um, you might know that if you fire a photon of sufficient energy and you can kick an electron out, and <clears throat> that's a process that's, that's pretty, you know, um, easy to describe in words, but pretty hard for theoreticians to describe accurately in, in a molecule, for instance. Um, double photoionization is even harder because there, you, one photon goes in, but two electrons come out. And really, the, the way that process is mediated is because the electrons are correlated to each other. They have an electron-electron repulsion. They have a spin interaction. And that's very also easy to say in words, but um, there's a lot of profundity to that kind of electron correlation. You know, we, we hand wave over it, but it is responsible for the entirety of the structure of atoms and molecules from the periodic table onwards. So the, the, the consequences of these physical effects are substantial. And it's really, really hard to describe these things um, uh, accurately, even for a bound state molecule, uh, you know, just how the electrons within a molecule interact with each other. To get that accurately is, is challenging. Um, but to also describe it now when they go out in the continuum, where you take one photon in and two electrons go out, that's really, really hard to do. And our interest in, in doing this is in uh, the greatest level of detail possible. Um, experimentally, what that means is, is that they have a molecule, and the molecule can be oriented in space. Um, and where the photon comes in and where the electrons go out, and how everything breaks up in that kind of space frame molecular picture is really, really challenging to do experimentally. Um, there are very sophisticated coincidence measurements that are done at the, adva at the advanced light source, for instance, um, so that, that are able to do these sorts of things, but disentangling that information really has required a lot of theoretical support. I say it's challenging in, in the sense that we've, there's really only one molecule that, that's been well understood in this process, and that's the simplest one, and that's H2, so a hydrogen molecule which only has two electrons to remove. And that was, you know, 15, 20 years of, of work that it took to get there. Where have we been since? Well, it's very, very challenging to do this sort of thing in, in, in with more electrons. And really that's kind of the nature of the work that I've done for a large part of the VFP um, is kind of un better approximations to describe that process in the, uh, in the molecular context where you have more electrons and try to approximate their interactions with the two that are outgoing. And the two that are outgoing are really the key to like, say you want to describe them as accurately as possible and try to fuzz over the, the influence of the others. That's kind of our first step for being able to solve these kinds of problems. Um, so I showed you uh, Alex's photo. Alex was the student I mo had most recently. Um, Alex is still continuing to work on this project in his own spare time. Um, he's going to graduate school in the fall um, in, his, in the field of biomechanical engineering, which is more in line with what he studied as an undergrad. But uh, Alex's VFP work is, is suitable for publication, and so we're, we're going forward with that. So I just wanted to show you kind of a, a graph that Alex recently sent us and trying to understand kind of uh, what we call an energy sharing cross-section. That smiley figure that you see there with the black long curve um, is what is physically true. Um, Alex's work with us has been kind of, well, what kind of approximations can we do to kind of get this without full level of detail and how can we understand this better? And so those are the kind of wavy curves. We understand kind of where the waves come from and things like that. So Alex has been working on this, uh, this problem for approximating uh, the way we get these double ionization amplitudes out of a, out of a full scattering problem. Um, and it's really kind of been nice to work with him um, since he even left the VFP program, but, but to try to make sure that he gets the publication for 
the two summers that he did put in because I think and really the, the work he had is, is going to be important for um, subsequent work that we have and 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 interesting things that, uh, that, that that we've been alleging for a long time so kind of he's given us a lot of insight into the problem now so didn't want to mention that um, I also said that we did we've done this for hydrogen that's pretty much the state of the art um, after 15 or 20 years of theory where are we going now well we really want to be able to do more chemically relevant molecules experimentalists have no trouble actually just putting these things in their chamber um, and then and then firing the photons at them and then catching the particles and within their signal the, you know um, there will be double ionization the hard part is is really they they need theory to understand what they're actually looking at um, the experimental picture is because it's so complicated um, disentangling it from all the other possibilities is very challenging and really it's only in the h2 part that, that theory and experiment kind of like work well together. So they're kind of waiting on us to solve a lot of these problems. <clears throat> um, we want to go towards kind of chemically relevant molecules, but baby steps at a time. We want to be able to make sure that we do these for things where we know work very well, like H2. And so that led us to kind of first consider this process for a molecule like a diatomic lithium. So lithium is the third element on the periodic table. Um, when you make it a diatomic molecule, it's very, very interesting because it's it's not very, it's very weakly bound, um, and it's got a very large internuclear distance. So it's barely a molecule, you can consider it. Um, so, but what's nice about it is, is that the, you, if you look at the molecular orbital diagram, you focus on those in the orange boxes there, the last two electrons going towards the top. Those are the ones that are going to be doubly ionized, and those are the ones that are going to look a lot like um, the two uh, electrons for hydrogen, which we really well understand. So our choice of this molecule was, it's kind of the, the closest to where we know what we're doing, but gives us a, a benchmark to establish, okay, are we getting this right um, incrementally rather than dive right in and say, well, what, what are we looking at from a really complicated molecule? So baby steps. This is not the end goal. This is working our way towards it, but it's a, a good system for us to kind of kind of uh, benchmark and debug on as we try to establish kind of uh, uh, methods for this. So, um, to try to limit the amount of mathematics that I'm showing it to, but but you know there are methods for kind of what you're look, what I'm trying to emphasize for you here is that we are approximating the two electrons that are going to uh, go outward, which are the the ones that you saw in that molecular orbital diagram uh, in the orange boxes up at the top. And the other two are just going to kind of consider some sort of influence for uh, for them being able to be seen on the outgoing electron. Um, so just wanted to kind of emphasize for you that, that the hydrogen molecular orbitals that you see on the uh, left there, and then the lithium ones are on the right. And you can kind of see some similarities as far as this sort of thing, but there are differences because the, the one is a 1s, one is a 2s, so there's lithium is a bigger molecule, um, and it's got these radial nodes. So it's already a much more challenging problem, um, but gives us kind of a, a nice over, overview with what we've got for uh, H2 to compare. So um, again, well, let me start with kind of some results that we've gotten in the last summer and kind of bridging up to where we are now. Uh, last summer, we calculated total cross-sections. Total cross-sections is basically the probability for this to happen as a function of the photon energy, which is on the horizontal axis. Um, there's one other uh, theoretical calculation, which are the black figures um, that exist. And you can kind of see, well, we, we, we've got similar structures, uh, but, you know, a, a difference in the magnitude of this sort of thing. And that's probably just based on the level of approximation that we have for those, those uh, non-ionized electrons, those, those core electrons there. Um, but as far as other theories go, that, that's it. That's, that's as much as been done on this problem um, before us. And so really what we want to study is kind of like the angular distributions, how these things look in the frame of the molecule. And so this is going to be new stuff that we're, that we're writing up for publication now. Um, um, there's a left and right side, and you can see, uh, let me focus on the left side here. What you're looking at is, you can see the, mole the molecular axis is the purple. Um, the photon polarization is horizontal, and there's a blue arrow which shows you kind of like where one electron would be going out in the frame of the molecule. So this is as detailed as the information can get in any of these experiments. Um, you see two different colors there. The black curves are what we have for lithium, and the red curves are what we have for hydrogen. Because again, they're analogous systems; they have the same symmetry, um, and it makes sense to do this comparison. But you can also see differences. That, that you know, um, there's some substantial differences between what the red and the black curves look like. So lithium results are new, and in fact, 
they've got generally more structure attached to them. Uh, if you focus kind of on the, uh, the upper left and the lower left panels, you'll see kind of additional structures there. Um, and in fact, like just even the sizes of the lobes and things like that, they're, they're different, um, which is kind of new. It's novel, it's interesting, and nobody's ever seen that before. So stuff is in common, but other things are more complicated because of that radial structure. Um, the ones on the right side that you can see, the right panels, those are showing a different, what we call a different energy sharing. So the two electrons going out have some excess energy from the photon that they can carry. The, the side on the left is equal energy sharing. We consider that more correlated because the electrons kind of like are, are more identical towards each other in the outgoing state. And then on the right side, you can see kind of unequal energy sharing. The fixed electron, the blue one, is, is got more to the, en the uh, energy. And then the one that's being plotted there is, is slower. So these are kind of you know standard plots that we that we do to compare with what the experimentalists have measured measured for H2. Um, and you can kind of see some comparisons there that, that we wanted to focus on. So it, it makes sense to understand this process uh, relative to H2. That's kind Sorry of Sorry to right interrupt, now. Frank. We have about one minute to wrap up. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll get to it. Um, let me also mention that kind of we want to understand the nature of the correlation, uh, kind of how it builds in. That's using something called a natural orbital uh, analysis. So this is a well-known technique in, in quantum chemistry to kind of uh, uh, start from the most important contributions for uh, electron correlation. And really what you're seeing here in this picture is, uh, again, another picture from lithium too. But in each panel there, we're just adding more and more electron correlation um, by adding more of these natural orbital contributions. Uh, you can see that this is kind of dramatic because for H2, the results change drastically. The shapes of these things change drastically. But for lithium too, they don't. And you can see kind of it's got this double lobe structure away from the fixed electron heading out towards the right in each of the panels. And, and that just gets kind of moderated as in, in size and with some little, some little tiny features as you add more uh, electron correlation. This is really noteworthy because in H2, this changes a lot. The, the actual structures and, and where the lobes go and things like that, it really changes um, from panel to panel. And here it's not so much. So that's telling us that that lithium-2 is, is not as correlated as H2 as far as the effect on the outgoing electrons um, from studying just how the initial state influences that. So that's kind of a, a surprising result. We, we, we're trying to put it in better context as we formulate this. Um, so just to kind of conclude now, since I'm out of time, uh, kind of what we're doing is, is, is uh, to progress, um, to better understand this where theoreticians can, can inform uh, the experiments that are ongoing for these sorts of things, um, which are really, really complicated, which uh, involve a lot of electron dynamics and, and um, trying to measure something that's a really small signal on top of the signal ionization, which is like swaps it. Um, and so theory is really kind of working towards that. And just let me say the, the, the long-term goal for doing all of this is to get to something like water. And water is a really, you know, quintessentially important molecule. It's got a lot of electrons. And so we are kind of baby stepping our way towards better understanding that sort of thing. Uh, so I'm just showing you now an experimental plot for water. It's sitting in the can. It needs a theory to kind of disentangle what's going on there. And we are gradually working our way towards it. So let me just acknowledge um, the collaborators, Bill McCurdy, Tom Rossino, and Robert Casey, who supervise our group. And um, thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Frank. Does anyone have a few questions? No questions? Okay, well, then we're going to give you all back the rest of your time. And I look forward to seeing you all this afternoon for our networking event. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.